Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Dietrich, Longwood Gardens Associate Director of Membership, and I would like to welcome you to the beauty of dahlias. This event will be recorded and the video with a dahlia resource guide will be emailed to all attendees. At the end of the presentation, Roger and Mara can answer your questions about dahlias. You may submit your question via the chat. Now it is my great pleasure to in introduce our presenters. Roger Davis, Outdoor Landscape Manager. Roger inherited his love of plants while working at his family's greenhouse business. He was introduced to the public horticulture culture through internships at the American Horticulture Society at River Farm and the Chicago Botanical. Roger has been a part of the Longwood staff for over 20 years, where he has worked in many of the outside garden areas. His interest in growing dahlias at Longwood has sparked a new enthusiasm in this wonderful flower. Mara Tyler, the owner of the Oxford Farm. California native turned Pennsylvania flower farmer, Mara Tyler grew flowers in small spaces for over 20 years in her home state. She now farms and offers floral education in Southern Chester County on a 12 acre, 12 acre farmlet. The farm in Oxford specializes in growing specialty cut flowers for local designers and floral enthusiasts and offers unusual bulbs, fruits, and tubers for the American home gardener. Roger and Mara, thank you so much for being with us today to share your love of dahlias. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah, it's good to be with everyone today, Mara. Um, we're just happy to have you on the webinar today um, to bring your, um, your experience and your vantage point to this discussion. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and the farm at Oxford? Sure. Thanks, Roger. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Mara Tyler with the farm at Oxford. We have a boutique cut flower farm in Southern Chester County. Um, we're actually in the Lincoln University area. I'm about 20 minutes from Longwood. Um, we are in our seventh year of growing and dahlias is a very large crop for us, very important crop. Um, we'll talk a lot about that today. Um, but we also grow things like roses, peonies. Um, we do a lot of spring bulbs, ranunculus, anemones, basically anything that's kind of a diva. Um, I love to grow it. So that's a little bit about us. Awesome, thank you. So um, my name is Roger. Um, I have grown up kind of in the gardening world and was introduced to dahlias when I was growing a vegetable garden. And on kind of a whim, I threw a few dahlia tubers in the ground and they grew really well. Um, and so it kind of started there. And then each year adding more tubers to my collection and um, learning some mistakes along the way and um, having a little bit of success. Um, and so it was really fun to just start delving into the world of dahlias. Um, at Longwood, um, Pierre has records of planting dahlias here um, back in the 50s. And so you can see this image here of a cutting garden actually that was near the old visitor center. Um, so Dahlias have been grown here at Longwood for a number of years. Um, I think just in culture, just in general, dahlias have kind of their popularity have kind of um, ebbed and flowed different times for various reasons. But um, I think Mara was telling that um, she definitely has seen a resurgence in um, dahlias and just the interest of people having them in their garden um, as well as cut flower. Yeah, and um, I can add a little bit on that. So I feel as though dahlias have really come into their own in the last couple of years, especially in the cut flower industry. Um, when I started growing seven years ago, that's when I first started growing dahlias. Um, and they were easier to get. There weren't as many people growing them. There wasn't as much breeding happening as there is today. And it just seems as though now everyone has discovered how amazing dahlias are, um, which is great, but it can be a little um, difficult sometimes when you're trying to get like those special tubers that everyone wants. Um, 
but um, it is fun to see so many people become interested in growing dahlias. And we have about 2000 plants on our farm. Um, and every year I'm like, I'm gonna grow less because they're so high maintenance, but then somehow I still end up adding more, so. <laughs> you could never have too many, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the background and some of the history of dahlias. And um, I just wanted everyone to realize that um, they came from actually from the Mexico area. So they're Latin America is where they're native. And oftentimes, like the picture on the left, were single flowers. Um, and then over time, hybridization happened when they were taken back to Europe um, to produce a lot of the doubles and all the different flower forms that we see today. Um, another characteristic that dahlias all seem to have is the fact that they have hollow stems, um, which um, allows for a lot of water uptake, but also makes them a little on the brittle side. If anyone's grown a dahlia before, you know that you really need to stake them. Um, or if a storm comes through, they can get damaged in the storm with weight. Um, so they definitely all have the hollow stems. Um, and I don't know if you've um, ever read, but in South America, a lot of the native people would eat the tubers. So it's kind of a starchy root that is edible. I have not tried. Mara, have you ever had um, dahlia tubers before? I don't, I think my husband may have eaten one and he said it just tasted like watery potato. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and a couple other things that I wanted to mention was that um, dahlias in their original form in Mexico were photoperiodic. Um, which is just a fancy term for their daylight sensitive. So a lot of times that's why dahlias kind of do the best towards the end of the summer. They're usually growing the first part of the summer and then towards the end is when they really start flowering. Um, as well as the diversity in dahlias is because they have eight chromosomes. A lot of plants have much fewer chromosomes. So the more chromosomes you have, the more opportunity there are for different um, characteristics to be passed on to, to the seeds. Um, so that's why there's so much diversity and that's one of the reasons I love dahlias. Mara, would you like to talk a little bit about um, some of the different varieties? Sure, yeah. So um, there are dahlias come in many shapes, sizes, forms. I always get asked a lot of times we'll post like a photo of a bouquet with all these different types of dahlias. I have a couple of them here too. Um, for you guys to see, but, um, and there's, I don't even know how many classifications, maybe like 15, something like that. But the ones that we tend to grow on the farm and, you know, as Roger and I kind of go through this, you'll also notice that he might take a little bit more of a bend on the landscape and garden, um, like application of growing dahlias. But from my perspective, we are a commercial farm. So I look for things in dahlias that are a little bit different than say the average consumer who wants to grow them in their garden. Um, and it's hard because I'm a gardener by heart too, but nature. Um, but I like, so I love the way that they look, but then they have to be a good cut flower as well. So for us, probably the ball forms, um, which I'm trying to like look at the screen. I don't know if we have any like balls right there, but I have a ball here. So this is kind of like a ball form, um, but it's a little like a pom-pom. Um, and those tend to last the best for us when it comes to cut flowers. The anemones, which are kind of pictured on that slide in the middle, they're beautiful and really fun. The bees love them. It's great for pollen, but it's not as wonderful um, for a cut flower as it is for like pollinators and being gorgeous in the garden. So, um, you know, mostly balls, we don't grow a lot of double A's, the really giant ones, because they don't tend to last as long for our customers. Um, but it is hard because I do sometimes like to grow some of the fun big guys. I just have to temper it and um, try to stick more with the ones that work really, really well for, for a cutting. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, because um, that really does bring up a good point of 
um, every gardener kind of has to determine like what their purpose is for growing the dahlias. Are they going to be cutting them? Um, are they just enjoying them out in the garden? Are they looking for, um, you know, a certain size or are they looking for dwarf um, dahlias for containers? Um, so really a lot of what we're talking about today can be modified um, and we're giving suggestions, but really um, they can be taken as the suggestions. They, you can basically do whatever makes sense for you because you could spend hours and hours in your dahlia garden every day, right? Um, but that's not always practical for everyone's circumstances in life. Um, one day I hope to retire and spend all day in my dahlia garden, but I'm not at that point yet. So um, I have to maybe make a few shortcuts here and there to still enjoy them, but also make it manageable for the time that I have. I love this slide because of all the diversity in the flower forms. And on the next slide, um, this is not information that every dahlia grower needs to know, but I wanted to um, at least highlight some of the terminology used by the American Dahlia Society. Um, if you speak to someone from the society, they're going to use some of these terms. And so it's always good to kind of have um, a general working knowledge of what they're talking about. Um, and Mara, you've already discussed the, the giant dinner plate dahlias that are always referred to. And you can see in some of the box stores to buy tubers, and that's considered a double A. And they go down in size all the way down to the micro dahlias that are really tiny and small. Um, and so that is the classification that kind of gives you the size of the bloom. And then right as of right now, there are 21 flower forms that are recognized um, by the American Dahlia Society. However, if they don't have a classification for it, they just put it in novelty. <laughs> so that's just like a catch-all. Um, so as more forms are coming onto the scene, once there's enough established of that same form, then they'll name it. Um, so as of now, we have 21, but it's possible that the number could go up over time because there's always hybridizers looking to produce something new. Um, we all have our favorites. Mara's talking about um, for cut flower, the balls and the pom poms are really good because they last long um, in a vase. Um, but there's there's tons out there, um, and it's always fun to experiment and grow a different kind every year. So Mara, I'll let you talk a little bit about the culture and how you grow your dahlias. Sure. So we um, so first of all, I always get asked this question about. Uh, what full sun is. So I wanted to be sure that we added it in here. Full sun is technically six plus hours of sun per day, but as most of us probably know, like, you know, if you're getting full sun in your garden, a lot of times you're getting like 16 hours of sun, especially in PA in the summer. But um, so at least, you know, six plus hours. And in some really hot cases, you may even want to give them a little bit of shade. I do find that when we have, um, you know, in the, in the summer when they're growing, some of the um, plants do a little bit better with just a tiny bit of shade. Um, but I also feel like they're not that fussy. So if you do full sun and you can even do some part shade, the dahlias will just get taller, a little leggier. You might not see as many flowers, but they'll still grow for you. So I, I always like to err on the side of just like plant it and see, you never know. Um, rich, well-drained soil. So most of us here in Southern Chester County tend to have like loamy clay. <laughs> I know we have really thick red clay um, and the dahlias do okay there, but we might not get as many tubers um, created at the end of the year as someone who's more in like a sandy climate. But you do wanna make sure that your soil is draining well. The dahlias do not like to sit in water. Um, we lose varieties every year. You know, we plant them in May. And then we might get some summer or some late spring rains. And then we see some rot on the tubers sometimes when they kind of sit in the water. So, you know, we're always working to try to make sure that our soil is draining properly. Um, 
moderate fertilizers. So, and I think Roger and I are going to talk a little bit more about this um, <clears throat> later on the feeding slide. Um, but you do want to feed your dahlias. They can be somewhat heavy feeders, kind of like roses. And then grow time of 90 to 120 days. So um, we like to say from when we plant them in May to when we start to see the blooms will probably be anywhere from like three to four months. Um, every variety is different. There are some early bloomers that start blooming right away, not right away, but like at the three month mark. And then there's some that are really late, like black satin is one that is an extremely late bloomer for us. I finally got rid of it because even though I love it, I just cannot lose that one month of bloom time um, and all those stems that I can't cut and sell. So um, again, from a garden to a commercial perspective, it's a little different because in your gardens, you guys may give your dahlias a little bit more leeway than like we do on the commercial side. And then for bloom time, they tend to bloom for us. If we put them in May, like mid-May, then they usually bloom um, from anywhere from like early August through to frost. So they're one of the longest blooming crops for us here in Pennsylvania, which is great because a lot of our other seasonal crops tend to come and go within like four to five weeks. Um, you know, peonies are only with us for four to five weeks. Roses, we might get a couple flushes, but it's only like a two to three week time period. So the dahlias do really, like they are the star of that late summer show, I think in gardens and, you know, for our farm as well. And Roger, you know, you can probably speak to that from a Longwood perspective. Yeah, definitely. Um, dahlias, it takes a little while for them to get going. Um, so you really do have to kind of work along with not a lot of reward, but then when the fall comes and they really start blooming, that's when they really take over and uh, take over the show. Um, and in the end of the season, a lot of times, a lot of your time is spent deadheading um, in, in grooming plants because they are just producing so many new flower buds at that uh, end of the season. Um, so they're definitely a little bit of work in the beginning of the season, but then they, you get the payoff at the end. So here we have a slide that shows the magical tuber. It's, it amazes me every year when I plant tubers at my house um, that a giant plant can come from such a meager little tuber with one little eye. Um, on the, this, the, the larger picture, you can see the eyes forming. Um, sometimes it's easier to see than others, depending on whether you just dug them or whether um, they've overwintered and now it's springtime and they're starting to grow a little bit. Um, but really, it, they're a little bit different from a potato. Potatoes, you can chop up into pieces and there's eyes on that root. Whereas with dahlia tubers, the crown is where all the eyes form. And so you need a piece of that crown with an eye on it to produce a new plant. Um, and you can see on this picture, this clump of tubers can be divided up. And that's how a lot of dahlia growers then grow their crop and um, multiply their number of tubers so they can increase the number of plants that they have. At home, my garden always overflows. So it's an excellent opportunity for me to share tubers with neighbors and friends. So um, I think as gardeners, we all tend to do that. So it's always a fun thing to have someone else have a success from something that you gave them. Um, so we talked about the eye, you need the eye um, for it to grow. And you can see the picture in the lower corner. It's a fairly small tuber, but you would think that might be a small plant and it could be, but sometimes really large plants can come from little skinny tubers um, or from really small nubs. <laughs> so you have to not necessarily judge um, what you're gonna get from the tuber. Um, each variety is different. Some varieties produce like round, really fleshy tubers. And then other varieties, it's almost as thin as a pencil. Um, and they're very, you know, just long. So um, if each variety is different. And until you grow it, you really won't know. Some, that characteristic makes some of them easier to overwinter. 
the ones that have big fleshy roots are typically easier to overwinter because they don't tend to dry out as much. The skinny roots, I've had problems in the past of them drying out. So um, that kind of is a determining factor. Um, they all can overwinter, but some, some are easier than others. And dahlias that oftentimes you see in the garden centers that are already growing, um, the plants are growing, they're already flowering, they were pushed in a greenhouse. Sometimes they're tuber varieties, but sometimes they're seed varieties. Um, what we're talking about today are varieties that are grown from tubers. You typically don't see them in the garden center to buy them as plants. Um, we're looking at plants that are going to get three to five feet tall. Um, for a greenhouse, um, these cultivars they're picking are typically smaller and don't um, produce the large plant that we're going to be talking about today. So uh, you just have to remember that when you're at a garden center and you see a dahlia in flower in a pot, you just have to temper your um, expectations that that was intended for a certain purpose to be pretty at the time and to maybe sit on a patio, but not necessarily to turn into um, a giant plant that we're talking about today. Do you have anything to add to um, this Mara about tubers? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I saw a question pop up. I can't see all the questions, but sometimes I can see that, them pop up on the bottom. And one person asked um, where the eye was on the bottom, right tuber, and that's actually my photo. Um, and I think I was trying to show the eye in that photo and it just didn't really come through that well. But it's, you can see the crown and like the top part, it almost looks like there's little bumps on it. And that's an eye that's forming. And it can be difficult for new growers to identify the eyes when the tubers are dormant. So that large photo on the screen actually shows a really pronounced light eye that is ready to start sprouting. But in winter, sometimes they present just as these tiny little round dots on the crown. And I've been growing for seven years and I still have a hard time identifying eyes when dormant in winter. So I just tell people, we divide in spring. Um, and I think that, like, I think we have a slide later, where we talk a little bit about that. But um, I try to wait till spring a lot of times to, it, on some of the varieties that are a little more difficult um, and don't pop eyes right away. Because, you know, as Roger said, you have to have an eye on that tuber in order for it to grow. So I always like to be conservative and not chop my tuber up too much. If I'm not sure, you know, you might just wanna chop it in half or quarter it if it's a really big clump, because then the chances of you having eyes on those tubers is gonna be better. And I know a lot of the like really hardcore dahlia growers, they divide down to the single tuber. And I'm always nervous to do that um, unless I'm confident that there's an eye on there. So um, for growers, I always say like, just be a little cautious because you don't want to chop your tuber up and have this gorgeous giant thing. And then you like mutilate it and get no flower and get no blooms off it. So, um, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a learning curve on that. Yeah, there are a lot of resources online that show um, how to split them. There's a lot of YouTube videos, so that might be for a first time grower. It might be a good place to check out um, watching someone do it, because once you've seen someone do it one time through, you're like, OK, I got this. And so then you can give it a try. That's great, Mara. So Mara, do you want to talk about how you plant dahlia tubers at the farm? Yeah, so um, you can kind of see like a trenching video more to the right. And that's typically how we plant our tubers. Um, keep in mind, like, and Roger was going to talk a little bit about planting more in a landscape setting. Uh, but on the commercial farm, you know, we aren't going so much for it being beautiful in a garden with companion plantings and other types of flowers. It's all about get, getting it as quickly as possible from the tuber to a bloom like in a healthy manner where we still can get tubers at the end of the year. So we plant them pretty closely, um, very different than a typical landscape. We put ours about maybe like nine inches apart. Um, and then I think Roger had mentioned previously when I was talking to him that they do like 24 inches here. So it's a big difference. That nine inch versus 24 for us will still produce a like full life-size five-foot plant with like 
hundreds, maybe not hundreds, okay, like 30, 40 stems <laughs> by the end of the season for us. Um, but by doing that, we can plant more tubers in a small space. Um, so that picture that you guys see behind me, that's actually our field um, at the end of the season. And we have 2000 um, tubers planted in there and um, they all kind of pack in pretty closely. And it's not the best for, you know, disease prevention, pest prevention, but it does get us the blooms that we need. So um, you don't need a ton of space to plant dahlias. If you don't have a giant space, then you still can try them. Um, I would do nine to 12 inches, like minimum. And then um, as you can see in the trench, you can just like make a little trench, put the tubers in, cover them back up. And then that's like, that's really all you need to do. And I say like need with air quotes, um, like they will grow that way. And that's how we do it on the commercial side. Perfect. So here at Longwood, um, we incorporate dahlias into the garden that we're creating. Um, a lot of our annual displays have dahlias within them. And so we treat each plant kind of individually. Um, and so each one is planted. And one of the tricks that we always start with is um, putting a stake in first before you actually put in the tuber. Um, a lot of times, if you're just planting one tuber, you plant it and then you want to put your stake in, what happens if you skewer that tuber? Well, you've messed up that plant for the season. So it's probably not going to make it. So, but if you put your stake in first, then you can plant the tuber with the eye near that stake so that when it grows up, you have a great place to be able to tie that main stem to so that it doesn't get damaged. This picture is also a little bit deceiving. Um, oftentimes we don't plant an entire clump of dahlia tubers together. They're usually divided out into like one or two tubers. Um, if you plant the whole clump, it will work, but you typically will get seven or eight stems coming out of the ground. Um, and it can be a little challenging to stake that um, throughout the season. If you let seven stems grow, it will be so full and so dense um, and everything will be pushing to the outside. And so you might end up with a lot of breakage. So we try and stick to one or two stems coming up from that tuber. Um, and that seems to work for us. But like I said, everybody's circumstances are different. So if you're leery of dividing down to one or two tubers, you could split the, the plant in half and so maybe you have four or five tubers on a clump that you plant, and that's a great place to start. Um, one of the tricks that Mar and I were talking about when we were comparing notes was you have the tendency to want to water your tubers right away when you plant. That's a typical gardening, you know, tool that you use. When you plant something, it's new, it needs to get established, so you water it. And especially a potted plant, you might have to water it every day if it's hot outside, just so it has, has a chance to root out into the surrounding soil. But with dahlia tubers, you do not water them, right, Mara? No. <laughs> and I, I, I hear this all the time from people. They're like, my tubers never came up and yeah, I watered them in. And I was like, well, there you go. Um, they rot really easily. So dahlia tubers, um, as you know, Roger mentioned before, it's a hollow stem, but dahlia tubers are, they're like something like 70% water. Like they are really, really watery. And so they don't need any help from us to get going. Like you want to put them in bone dry soil, but here in PA, you know, usually we get a couple rains after the time you plant them from when they're to when they start growing. So you really do not need to do anything once you put them in the ground, unless we saw like really hot 90 degree temps with no water at all. Then sometimes I do, you know, water the soil just to keep it a little bit moist, but that's why when we plant in May is when we typically plant, um, we don't see those types of temps yet. So um, usually it's a little like it's on the opposite side because we see a lot of those late spring rains where sometimes we may get a lot of rain after we plant. So we kind of have to time around that. Um, I did see a couple of questions come in. And one thing I did forget to mention was planting depth. Um, so for us, 
We do about six inches underground. I know some people put them a little lower. You don't want to put them super deep. It's not like a tulip where it wants to be really low. Um, I do four to six inches because you want that eye to send a sprout up and be looking for warmth and the heat of the surface. So if you put them in too deep, then the sprout may rot and die, but before it actually gets to the surface. So um, I like to err on the side a little more shallow, and then you can always hill up as they start to grow. So if you put it in at four to five inches, as the sprout breaks the soil, you can kind of take the soil and like hill it up around the sprout as it's coming up. And that also helps give it a little bit more structure. Um, and then, you know, we're going to talk about staking as well, but that's just kind of our general planting depth. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I know at my personal garden at home, a lot of times I will kind of plant a little bit on a hill um, just because it's easier for that good drainage. Um, so if you're, if you have a lot of clay in your garden, that might be a way to kind of compensate so that it doesn't rot. Um, Cause there's nothing worse than having your hopes set on a nice dahlia patch and then half of them rotting, um, which also brings me to the point of, I typically hold back a few tubers and don't plant them because really you'll know in two or three weeks, which ones are going to grow and which ones aren't so that you can fill in any holes that you might have with some of these backup tubers, because no matter how good of a gardener you are um, and you, how well you've inspected your tubers, there's always a few that get past that are going to rot. Sometimes the rot is just on the inside of the tuber and hasn't made its way to the outside edge yet. So if you pull up one that didn't grow and you cut into the tuber, you can see like the center of the tuber had already started to rot. So having a few backups, just in gardening in general, having a backup plan is always good. Barb, you wanna start us out on health care or plant care? Sure. So after you guys get your dahlias planted, um, then, well, and actually like soil health, kind of while you're planting, if you wanna do a soil test, if you're not sure what type of soil you have, um, also in Chesco where we are, there's actually a website where you can go look at the types of soil that you, that you have at your address. So you just plug it in and I, I can go dig out that link if um, you guys are interested, but um, that's how we figured out what kind of soil we had before we moved here. But then also just doing the basic soil test to see what your pH is. You can get a test like at Lowe's or on Amazon and do that yourself. Um, and if you're really serious and you really like, we get our soil tested every year um, with an agronomist just to make sure that like, you know, we have the right balance of everything because we do grow so many dahlias on a commercial basis. So, um, you know, I think it's, um, um, I'm trying to think of the, is it Pennsylvania State or PS? PSU, I think they do, um, they'll test your soil for you too. So you can just like take some samples, send them in and they will send you a report. I think it's like $15. So depending on how serious you want to get with the soil testing, you completely can, can look into that. Um, and then once your dahlias are a couple inches above the ground, like I usually wait for the sprout to be maybe like this tall. Um, then we start watering them and we don't water if we get regular rain, but if we don't get regular rain, then we do water and you can drip water. You can overhead water. Um, we don't have a lot of disease issues in our field because we have a really open field with a lot of airflow. So we don't see a lot of like mildew and things like that. Uh, but I know some gardeners feel more comfortable with like a drip feed on their dahlias as opposed to overhead watering but that's really totally up to you. I mean, garden hose in your garden is, is perfectly acceptable. And then from a feeding perspective for us, because we are all about the flowers, it's totally different than being in your garden. You know, I, I, like my customers will send me photos of their plants, which are like giant seven feet tall. And they're like, they haven't flowered yet. For us, we're all about getting those flowers as soon as possible. So we give our flowers, um, we do sea grow fertilizer. I, and I believe this is also in the research sheet, um, but we just get it on Amazon and it's like, it's a, a fairly organic non-chemical based fertilizer. And um, we do um, like, a, like a balanced fertilizer. So I think it's like a 16, 16, 16. So it's going to feed the leaves and the stems. It's gonna feed 
the um, plant to make a flower and also start feeding the tuber and, and the roots. So it's like fully balanced fertilizer. So we do that once or twice while they're getting going just to make sure that they're getting everything they need. I also might give them calcium and magnesium just to make sure that we're seeing strong stems. Um, and then once we start to see the plant maybe reach about, I wanna say like two feet tall, we start feeding it with heavy phosphorus fertilizers. So first of all, phosphorus will push the blooms, but you guys also wanna make sure their soil doesn't have a lot of phosphorus in it already, because then you're just kind of like adding it on top and it doesn't need it. Um, but for us, we don't have as much in our soil. So we do that and it starts to push the blooms for us while the plants are a little smaller. So, you know, our plants might start blooming at three feet instead of six. But in a garden scenario, you know, you may be looking for a more lush, large flower, whereas we're looking for the flowers to kind of start right away. So that's that's how we do it, Roger. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, those are some good tips. Um, I definitely wanted to echo that as a gardener in general, everything starts with the soil. So if you can start with healthy soil, and with good pH and some, some organic material to hold those nutrients when you fertilize, um, it definitely gets you going in the right direction. Um, if you start off with a site that's never had anything but grass grow on it, um, it might take a few years to really build up that soil health to get you know, a dahlia plant to grow really well in that area. Um, so, if it's a planting bed that's already been growing perennials and other flowers for a number of years, you're probably in pretty good shape um, soil wise. And so you can get started a little sooner. You might have to do a little soil prep if you're creating a whole new bed where nothing's ever grown before. So definitely thinking about the, that soil prep and um, just the health of your soil is definitely a good first step. And then once the plant gets growing, um, it tries to shoot up to the sky as fast as possible. Um, but as gardeners, we want nice, strong, sturdy plants that are going to give us lots of flowers. And so pinching is a way to help your plant become bushy and strong. Um, so here at Longwood, oftentimes we will start our dahlias in pots and then transfer them out into the garden. And a lot of times this is the point we've, we're moving them into the garden is once you've had three or four sets of leaves grown, then you take the center out, you just pinch the center out of it. And then all of these side shoots, like in this picture, will start growing. And then that will create a nice bushy plant um, that then you get loads of blooms off of. If you let it go, it'll just go straight up and you'll get a big flower right at the top. And then you'll get some side shoots, but it's very top heavy. Um, so this I think is an important step that sometimes gets missed. Um, and I think it can really help um, create a quality plant later in the season. Mara? Yeah, so pinching, um... I don't always get to around to pinch, pinching all our plants because we have so many of them, but in the garden, I absolutely recommend it to people. Um, the idea with pinching is it will delay your bloom a little bit. So if you don't pinch, then that, that center stem will skyrocket up, give you the big flower. But then when you cut it down, you're going to be cutting fairly low and then it's going to start branching out. So in essence, you can pinch or you can wait for the big flower and then pinch it, but then you're going to be waiting a lot for your next flush. So if you pinch when there are a couple inches, like, you know, we, we pinch when there's about three leaf sets, um, then the side shoots will start making long stems and you'll get flowers on each of those stems. So you're really creating like a plant that's going to give you, you know, maybe like 15 flowers at once instead of the one. And so if you're just so anxious, you can't like wait, you know, by all means, like, let it go nuts. But then um, you'll just have to wait longer for your neck cut of, of bloom. So I try to pinch as many as I can. And usually when we're weeding, I'll like pinch as I'm weeding just to try to get them going. But also it will give you, as Roger said, a bushier plant that is going to be less likely to flop over like the next time a storm comes. 
and it'll just be healthier. And if like one shoot breaks off, then you still have other ones that are growing. Whereas if you don't pinch it and a storm takes out your giant six foot plant with one bud at the top, then you're kind of like back to, to ground, you know, to ground zero. Um, and then I also did want to mention, we didn't mention, I guess, the right pH for dahlias. And from what I recall, can't, like, not, not perfect, but neutral, I believe, is like the right way to be for dahlias. So I want to say it's around 6.5-ish pH. Um, but again, I haven't found them to be super fussy because areas of our farm are anywhere between six and seven, and they do okay either way. You know, you just don't want to have really, really um, acidic or, or um, you know, soil or otherwise. So um, most garden soils are going to be are going to be okay for that. Perfect. Yeah, um, I would say on the topping or pinching of your young plants, um, this picture maybe, in my opinion, isn't quite what I would go for. I would try and pinch it um, when it's a little bit younger and not quite such a large diameter because now you have a hole for like water and pests to possibly enter the plant because of the hollow stems. So once you get four leaves, you can kind of like break that tip out and then it doesn't leave quite as large of a scar, um, but it works um, really good and it helps keep kind of those stems coming from the base so that you have a nice sturdy plant. Because um, once you get the large stems coming out higher on the plant, it's hard to keep that tower of foliage upright towards the end of the season. So this is kind of that work that goes in in the beginning that really pays off towards the end of the season. And so I also wanted to in include a slide here on this budding. Um, this is for the person who has some time and really wants to possibly show dahlias or um, they really wanna get as large of a flower. They wanna see if they can grow that dinner plate dahlia. You'll want to start to pull off side buds to encourage all of the energy to go into that terminal flower at the top. And so you can see on the diagram to the right, um, you take off the buds that are in the number two position after the first set of leaves, and then you'll even go down below that um, and pull out those next buds. And you can just bend them to the side, and they oftentimes will just snap right off because the plant is so turgid. So you can just groom the plant. You want to try and catch them when they're pea size, so when they're still fairly small. Um, and then that will send all that energy into that central flower, and then it will get the size that you're hoping for if all goes well. Um, some varieties also, the side shoots want to outgrow the central terminal flower, and so the flower will end up being tucked inside of the foliage. The side shoots will try and outgrow that. Um, so some varieties are just notorious for that, so it's a good idea to disbud if you can. Um, so that the flowers aren't hidden down in the foliage. But I don't always have time to do this, so I'll do what I can um, and then just enjoy the flowers. And then the flowers will be smaller, but there will be more of them. At Longwood, we typically don't disbud unless there's a variety that does hide those blooms just because it's really time consuming and we want as many flowers as possible for our guests to enjoy as opposed to, as opposed to, you know, one giant flower, they'll have, you know, 20 or 30 on a number of plants um, that they can enjoy. Mara, at your garden, you can just let them flower, right? Yeah, I mean, we don't have time to disbud all the plants and um, like we do get slightly smaller flowers, but then also it allows me to manipulate bloom a little bit. So if I don't need that central bud, then I might pinch it out and let the side buds develop. And a lot of varieties will actually give you full long stems on the side buds. And then I'll take both of those if I need them. So for us, sometimes it's about timing. Like, do I need the central bud? If not, I'll pinch that out and I'll let the side buds develop or one side bud develop. So it's really like, I always tell people like play around with your dahlias as you start to grow them, like year after year, you'll get more data on how to, how you can kind of manipulate them a little bit. So for staking and corralling, um, I know Longwood does a little different here because they're again, working in that garden setting. 
Um, but we do more of a corral, which you can kind of see some examples in the slides here. Um, but because we have long, like 75 foot rows, then we basically uh, create a corral and we try to like keep them maintained in the corral. And then we um, will have like a break every so often we'll retie it off. So it doesn't always work perfectly. I'm always trying to like get better with our corralling and staking because when the storms do come through, a lot of times the plants just go down. End of season, the stems are softer, the plants are tired, or so they do drop more easily. Um, but I always have the best of intentions at the beginning of the year, and then I feel like we're in good shape, and then you know things start falling over. But again, if you do pinch pretty low and young, then you will get a bushier plant. It's going to be more like this as opposed to this tall, you know, skinny thing that's going to flop over. Yeah, staking is definitely a job that continues throughout the summer. You don't stake it once and then you're done. So if you have to continually go back and keep tying. Um, one little tip that I've tried with some smaller varieties is using a tomato cage. Um, that's a way that you can kind of hem them in without having to continually go back and tie. So that might be one tip for you to try at home. Um, pests do like dahlias, right, Mara? So we're just going to go over some of the highlights of the pests that you might encounter in your dahlia patch. Yeah, so here in PA, we have a lot of pests. Um, our ligus slash tar tarnished plant bug is like my main nemesis. Um, you can see the damage that it does there on in the picture on the left. Essentially, it mutates the flower so that only half of it blooms. And sometimes you can't see this in bud form. Um, so it's a challenge for us because, um, you know, I don't want to let that flower develop only to realize I've lost it. So we have started bagging our blooms. We also have horrible grasshoppers this year. I've heard it from multiple people. I think it's the cicadas. Um, the birds are eating the cicadas, not the grasshoppers. So we have hundreds of grasshoppers in the field right now. Um, so by, we get these organza bags off of Amazon and we've started bagging the blooms and it's an extra step for us. But again, like I can't sell that left picture bloom, sadly. So that guy got deadheaded and then I have to try to get to the bloom to bag it um, when it's in bud form before the tarnished plant bug sucks the juice out of the bud and, um, def and deforms it. So um, it's a bad past year for us this year. We didn't have to bag last year, um, but it is something that you will definitely, you know, see a lot of. We also have um, leaf hoppers, which I think is on the next slide. Um, and we had leaf hoppers very badly this year. This is actually a picture of one of our plants um, there. And they are suckers on the leaves. They don't bother the blooms. So they're just, they just suck on the leaves. So the plants just look horrible. Um, we did release beneficial bugs because we do try to grow organically as much as possible. Um, but they don't kill the plant. They just weaken it and make it more stressed. Um, so that is something that we have to deal with on a regular basis too. Yeah. And at Longwood, we oftentimes run into spider mites, um, during the hot part of the summer, spider mites, um, live on the undersides of the leaves and they're very small and oftentimes you can't see them until they get um, pretty bad. And on the upper side of the leaf, you'll see this stippling, these little dots on all the leaves. And then you know that that's what you have. Um, one way to get around this organically is to syringe your plants, to wash your plants, the undersides of the leaves. So when you're watering, if you can turn the pressure a little higher and just kind of blast underneath the leaves, um, periodically, that will help um, decrease your population of spider mites. Um, mosaic virus is another issue in the dahlia world. Um, viruses are untreatable, so you really have to pull the plant out and discard it and not in your compost. You want to put it in a bag and send it out with your regular trash um, because it can pass from one dahlia plant to another um, by way of your utensils, by pruning. If you prune an infected plant and prune ne the next plant, you can pass it to your other plants as well as through insects. So it's definitely important to keep an eye open for viruses. And they make this kind of mosaic pattern on the leaves. 
Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between nutritional issues and mosaic. It just takes a little bit of experience um, and online resources might be able to help you out as well. Looking at images, I find help me to kind of diagnose online. Um, and powdery mildew at Longwood, we also have, and it's usually towards the end of the season and it starts on the bottom of the plant. And you'll see this kind of like gray powder on the leaves and you can treat with fungicide if you would like. Um, a lot of times you can also pluck foliage off and if it's hidden in the back of a bed, you know, it's not the end of the world. It won't kill the plant. You're almost to the end of the season. So if it's not too bad, you can let it go. Um, it usually, unless it's super bad, it usually doesn't make it all the way to the top of the plant. It usually just kind of defoliates the bottom of the plant, but usually the garden is so big and lush by that point, it's not that noticeable. You could just clean up the foliage. Laura, you want to talk about some other overwintering options? Yeah. So now, you know, we're at the end of the, we're at the end of the season, you're getting ready to figure out what to do with your dahlias. Um, I wanted to talk really quickly about overwintering, which is something that we could, like we can technically, technically do in our area here. And we have done it in previous years. This is an image of our, of some of our overwinter dahlias um, in uh, March of this year. But if you don't want to dig your dahlias at the end of the season, um, you can overwinter them. You have to cut the dahlia back to the ground. We mound with about 10 to 12 inches of leaves or other type of material. We use leaves because we have tons of them. But if you have, you know, straw or something like that, that would work as well. You just want to insulate that plant um, and the ground from freezing. And then we cover the entire area once we're done with that um, with a plastic tarp. So you don't want anything that's going to let moisture into the ground um, because our ground often does freeze here in PA and you need to prevent your ground with the dahlia tubers in it from freezing in order for them to come back the following year. Now, if we have a mild winter, a lot of times you don't have to do anything and they come back, but you know, the chances of that are totally hit or miss. So um, the one thing I will mention about overwintering is that this year we did have a really bad slug problem in our overwinter dahlia because of the beautiful environment that we created for the slugs. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, the plants came back fine, but we were really battling slugs on those dahlias this year. And that's something that we don't have to deal with when we plant them fresh in May, because by then the, like the slugs have gone away because it's too hot. So, um, you know, you might have to deal with some things that you wouldn't have to deal with if you planted in May, but you also don't have to worry about storing your tubers then at the end of the year. So that is an option for people who maybe only have like 10 or 15 dahlias in their garden. Maybe you don't want to dig them up. Um, then you can just protect them, cover them, and then, you know, see if they come back for you the following year. Yeah, that's also awesome. That's a Definitely a great um, plan for people who want to just see if they can try and make them over winter. But most of the time, um, people who want to keep their tubers from year to year will dig them up. And so here's a picture of some dahlia clumps that have been dug. And at Longwood, we dig them up. And a lot of times you wait till the frost knocks them down and turns them brown before you store them but we actually have to move on to planting bulbs. So we dig ours, you know, the third week of October. So we cut the tops off and then we'll store these clumps in bulb crates and we'll put hardwood mulch that has some moisture to them around them and store them in a place like a greenhouse that's just minimally heated underneath a bench where they don't really get a whole lot of attention or water and they just kind of hang out during the winter. And then in spring, we divide and pot up our tubers to get started for the next year. Mara, how do you um, store yours? Um, so storage for us, we actually, and, and, and again, this is a commercial farm, so it's a little different, but we have a cooler where we keep our flowers in the summer. Um, we have any seed in it, but in the winter, we actually put a heater inside of that insulated room and then we store the tubers in there. So we store them exactly as the Rogers photo books. We dig them, we put them in crates exactly as appears. Each crate is a variety. And then we stack them in our cooler. So last year, I think we had 85 crates of tubers. 
Um, and then I keep a temperature gauge in there just to make sure that the humidity levels are very high because you do need to make sure that your dahlias don't dry out in the winter. Um, but you also don't want there to be too much moisture in like in the soil and in the room. So it's very delicate balance. Like I will say storage is such a hard thing for, for new growers. Most of my customers like lose their tubers in storage. I lost my tubers the first two years and had to start over every, every time. Um, so once you figure out what works for you, I tell people just keep doing it. Um, but you know, experiments and hold them in like Rubbermaid tubs with pine shavings or cedar. Um, you might just have to miss that. Some people put them in their basements because they stay at a certain uh, like humidity and temperature level. Um, but every situation is different. So, yeah, every time I talk to dahlia growers, everyone has a little different trick for it. So everyone does it a little differently. So you do have to experiment a little bit for your each situation is a little different. So we've kind of talked a little bit about this already with dividing tubers and you can see how um, the crown of the tuber, you want a, a little piece for each for each tuber to have a growing point, an eye to form. You can see eyes aren't super visible on this one, but sometimes you have to take it on faith that there's some eyes typically all over that crown. Um, at Longwood, we typically divide in early spring because that's when we have time, but everyone does it a little bit different. It's just kind of when you have time to do it. And if it's easier, you know, for you to store a small amount as opposed to a giant clump of tubers. Um, so each person does a little bit different in the Dali society. So you kind of have to find what works for you. And your garden will look like this at the end, right, Mara? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just need a couple thousand tubers in there. <laughs> So, so here's some um, of Mara's favorites. Yeah, so here's here's a slide that shows you guys some of my favorites. Keep in mind, I don't always go for like the most fun, you know, shapes and forms because it's all about the longevity and the flowers for us. So Sylvia is one of our um, great oranges. Blizzard is a total workhouse white for us. Super long stems. You can see them in that photo. Um, really nice form, lasts extremely well. Um, Ivanetti is a very dark purple, almost burgundy ball that works extremely well for us. Um, honeydew is one of my outlier favorites. Horrible plant habit, flops all over the place, like giant hollow stems that rot out, but the flowers are actually some of my favorites. So I still keep honeydew in the, in the commercial garden, even though every year I vow I'm like gonna get rid of it. Um, and then Clearview Peachy is one that we added last year and quickly became one of my favorites. Um, super tall, very vigorous plant, lots of blooms, very long, strong stems. And this color family is very desirable for a lot of our like weddings and florists and things like that. So this has definitely become one of my favorites, but we grow 85 varieties. So it's like so hard to choose five favorites. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I had, I had to pick a few of my favorites as well, but it was really hard. Um, I typically in the garden enjoy the larger blooms um, because they stand out amongst all the other flowers. Um, and so here are some of my picks. Um, some of these, actually many of these are old varieties that have been around for a long time. Um, but every year there's hundreds of new varieties that are being put out on the market. So I like to grow new varieties every year. So that's part of the fun. Laura, I'll yes. let you talk about cut flowers. Yeah, so, um, and actually I, we added 40 new varieties this year that we're trialing. So I am with you on the adding every year to Roger. Um, so cut flowers, um, if you guys want to cut your dahlias and bring them inside, just a couple tips for you on, on how to do it. Um, so cut your stems deep into the plant. Um, I take like, so my first cut's probably going to be like pretty low into the plant because I want it to continue to bush out and create more and more of a bushier plant with lots of stems. Um, so we cut stems deep and we leave about maybe three to five leaf sets on the plant. Um, if it's a really tall plant, it's already like five or six feet, that's going to be too low for you. So don't take it, you know, down super low, but you want to cut maybe a stem that's something like this. Um, and then I tell all my customers three to six days base life. Balls may last longer. We do use Crisol for our dahlias. We don't do a lot of chemical treatments to our dahlias. 
um, I mean, to our plants in general, to our flowers, but we do always use Crisol for dahlias just because they are such divas. Some dahlia forms only last two days, like the anemones don't last very long at all. And so if we're giving them to customers, I wanna try to give them like the highest level of success. Um, keep your arrangement out of sunlight. Don't leave the flowers out of water. We, you know, it's like, this is all stuff that we tell our customers in general. Change your water daily. So dahlias are dirty flowers. That means that when the water like stays on that stem, it starts rotting out the stem and will like bacteria get into your water and will kill your dahlias faster. So definitely change your water out daily. And then someone else had asked, I saw a question pop up about when to cut the flower. Dahlias are one of the flowers that don't really open up much after you cut them. The only varieties that really do are the dinner plates. They open up a little bit more, but so we try to cut the flowers probably about two thirds open because that's gonna give you the best face life. If you wait till they're fully blown open and you can see the center, then you will not get as long of a base life on that flower. So experiment a little bit with your varieties that you have in your gardens. Um, but you'll quickly see like which ones cut better for you than others. And Mara, do you typically um, cut your flowers in the morning and in the cool of the day? Yeah, so ideally you want to try to cut your flowers in the morning or at night after the sun has kind of gone down because the heat of the day, it's really sapping the energy. The petals are thinner. Um, but, you know, for us, sometimes we don't have that luxury. And if I have to go cut for an order, I just have to go cut for an order. But yeah, if you like are trying to get the most out of, out of them, I would say cut in the cool of the morning or um, in the evening towards dusk. And, and honestly, those are like the best times to be in the garden. So definitely. Um, I also wanted to put a plug in for the Greater Philadelphia Dally Society. They have an amazing show here at Longwood, um, typically each September. Um, here's the date for this year, and um, it's free for, with garden admission. And this is a great way to find varieties that people grow in your area, um, because sometimes certain varieties grow better on the West Coast than they do here in our heat and humidity. So this is a great place to be able to talk to experts and to see named varieties that you can then purchase. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, that I go to the Dahlia Show every year because I get so many ideas on varieties um, to grow. And a lot of times you'll see really cool like seedlings that have not been introduced to the market yet that some people are hybridizing around us. And then you like might see that, you know, in a couple of years out on the market. So it is really fun. Um, I just also wanted to talk really quickly. So if you guys loved this and you're local and you can pick up flowers, then we are doing a class um, on September 30th. There's two sessions. Um, it's an online live streamed hands-on workshop. So you will pick up your dahlias and flowers here at Longwood. And then we will do an online session with me. Um, to, you can choose from two sessions. Um, so it's through Longwood. We did it last year. It was really fun. Um, and I love sharing my dahlias with our locals. So if you guys are interested in that, you can uh, register online. And um, Melissa, I'm not sure if like they can get a link or something sent you know, out to them. But if you're interested in that, um, feel free to let us know. Yeah, space is limited. So sign up now if you're interested. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be here before we know it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So we wanted to give you a list of some of, kind of, some of the places that we buy tubers from, um, just so you have a starting place. Um, these are some larger growers, but then there's also some that are smaller growers. Um, and some have websites and then others you may have to ask for, uh, ask for a catalog to order from. Yeah, and I'll just add here um, that, as I mentioned in the beginning, dahlias are hot, hot, hot right now. Like, so we used to order in January for the following year, and now people are opening their shops in like September, October. So if there's a variety that you guys really want, try to just find out when the shop that has it um, is going to open up because it's stuff is selling out really quickly. The other thing I did want to mention too on sources is it's really important to get your stock from a quality farm. So I really 
tell people try not to buy from Lowe's and Home Depot <laughs> because those are imported um, Holland tubers. And sometimes they may have disease or they may have bugs or something. Whereas all these sources here are all American grown um, Dahlia producers and everyone grows their these tubers in the US. And a lot of these guys, actually almost all of them that I can think of um, do virus testing and they really like are vigorous about making sure that they're giving you a quality tuber. So source does matter when it comes to dahlias. So here's a few um, websites that you can look up, the American Dahlia Society, Greater Philadelphia. And I put Colorado Dahlia Society because there's tons of information on growing tips and a lot of picture tutorials. Um, so if you have questions, these are some places to look at, as well as Penn State Extension. And Mara has a, has a lot of um, social networking places that you can check out as well. Yeah, so um, if you're local, follow us on Instagram. We post ideas all the time. Um, and also there's um, another local person, Leanne, she's Cozy Town Flowers, and she's actually doing some really great dahlia breeding. Um, so it's really exciting to see her because she grows like 40 minutes from us. And as Roger had mentioned, sometimes people who breed dahlias where you are, that's going to be a plant that's great for your garden. Um, one of the books here is Christine Albrecht's Planet Cruz Dahlias. She's one of my favorite dahlia breeders. She's such a sweet person. Um, and she, hybridizes and breeds dahlias in Santa Cruz. They're gorgeous, but we grow some of her varieties here and they just don't perform for us the same way as they do for her because her, you know, her season is different and her, she gets like fog until noon every day. You know, it's like beautiful. The dahlias love it. Um, but for me, you know, they're shorter, they're smaller. So I still try, but you know, it really does make a difference um, in terms of like finding those local people that really are going to be able to get you varieties that are going to shine. Um, and then Summer Dreams Farm is one of my friends, Michael. He has a huge Dahlia farm in the US and he does so much Dahlia education too. So definitely worth a follow if you, um, you know, if you like that kind of thing. Well, thank you so much, Roger and Mara. That was fantastic. We have a couple of really quick questions. So Jody asked, are there varieties that are more deer resistant than others? Do you have a suggestion? So dahlias, unfortunately, are not deer resistant. <laughs> so I don't think it's variety specific. I think like if a deer comes across a dahlia, it's going to munch it. So protect them um, if you have deer issues. Sadly, a lot of us do in this area. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, another question. Planting tubers. So when you're planting them, do they, does the crown need to be oriented up? So on the two pictures in the trench, they look like the tubers were laying down. And then in the hole, they look like the, the, the crown or... Uh, was facing up. Could you share just a few details on that? Sure. Um, a lot of times the tubers grow kind of in an array and a lot of the tubers are kind of laying flat when you dig them up in the fall. So I like to lay them down or angle them. And a lot of times if you can see the eye already um, on that tuber, you can kind of orient it so that it's already shooting up. And then it should, it shouldn't be a problem. Technically, if you could just throw it in, however, and it should grow and figure it out, but it makes me feel a little bit better when I plant it to kind of orient it the right way. Um, but I, I do kind of lay them, lay them on their side when I plant at home. Last question. Could you repeat the name of the fertilizer, Mara, that you mentioned? Oh yeah. So it's Seagrow, like, so S-E-A and then G-R-O-W. Um, and I get it on Amazon. So there's a balanced version, which I think is 16, 16, 16. And that's the first. So, so we start with that. And if you don't want to get two types of fertilizer, fertilizer, you can just use the balanced. Um, and then after we've got the dahlias growing, then we move to the heavy phosphorus, which I think is like 426, 15, something like that. And that's going to push the bloom for you, but also feed the root. So it's going to not give you as much, you know, leaf nitrogen growth, but start to give you the blooms. Um, 
And then uh, for CalMag, I get it on Amazon too. And it's just literally calcium and magnesium. And that will also help with stem strength. Um, sometimes the heads can be so heavy that if you give a little bit of calcium, um, you know, you're just creating a thicker, stronger stem for that, for that dahlia. Fantastic. One last question. If you don't get to plant all of your dahlias, could you hold them for the following year? Or if they need they need some nutrition, probably water. Yeah. So what we do because we don't plant all our tubers, and sometimes I want to keep a variety for next year. Um, I'm sure this never happens at Longwood. Yeah. Um, but we will toss them into a crate like those black crates that you saw in some of the photos or a pot with just some soil and let it just make a couple leaves and you know just like keep it alive. And then um, at the end of the season, I would just cut it back and then store it in that crate and just like keep it there so that you're not disrupting it too much because it didn't really get much that year, but it's still alive, so. Fantastic. Mara, Roger, thank you so much for sharing your love of dahlias with our members. Um, we've been receiving uh, notes that they've loved the presentation, so thank you. And I would also like to thank our members. Thank you for your support. Uh, it not only preserves our rich legacy, but also helps Longwood Gardens to continue to inspire to, for many generations to come. So from all of us at Longwood, thank you. Have a great day.